Hello, I'm Francois Antoine, Director of HMI and Embedded Systems at Epic Games. And I'm Joe Andresen, Technical Product Manager for HMI and Embedded Systems at Epic Games. Today, we're very proud to announce our Human Machine Interface Initiative. Our dedicated HMI team of technical artists and engineers is committed to this effort, and we are continually adding new features to benefit all manufacturers. We're thrilled that General Motors recently announced GMC Hummer EV will be the first vehicle to use Unreal Engine in its digital cockpit. This marks an exciting partnership in building next-generation experiences on embedded systems. Unreal Engine provides key features for design-driven development. Quickly iterate with Blueprint's visual scripting, collaborate with complete version control support, instantly preview designs on your desktop, and stay in control with direct access to source code. These features and more enable designers, artists, and developers to work directly on the project that is deployed to the vehicle. Unreal Engine is a comprehensive toolset for creating beautiful, interactive visuals using our advanced scalable renderer. Niagara is a state-of-the-art particle system that brings your designs to life. Downloadable content instantly changes the look, feel, and functionality of your UI giving your users the freedom to customize their experience. To highlight our commitment to HMI development, we're happy to announce that in addition to Linux and Unreal Engine as a library on Android, we're working to bring Unreal Engine to BlackBerry QNX's Neutrino microkernel real-time operating system. And you'll be able to craft a great navigation experience with our upcoming integration of Mapbox. With highly tested features used by millions of artists and developers, Unreal Engine opens up exciting possibilities for all creators. From prototyping and concepting to final production and beyond, Unreal Engine is with you the entire way. Hello and welcome to another Educator live stream for Unreal Engine. We are very pleased today to have special guest, Mohamed Moim. And today we're going to be talking about Python, understanding and teaching Python inside of Unreal Engine, which is really exciting. Uh, this is a stream that I've been really looking forward to and a special guest that I've been really looking forward to having on the stream. And as usual, we have Mark Flanagan here from the United Kingdom. And you can tell it's a little chilly everywhere because he's wearing his nice hoodie. And we've got Tom Shannon joining us uh, today from a very special place, Colorado. He's usually here Hello. in Cary, North Carolina. I'm but chilly here. He's chilly also in Colorado. And Mohammed joins us from Montreal. And it's really a pleasure to have Mohammed. We've known each other for quite some time. And... Uh, um, we've worked together on a number of different projects, um, and we've corresponded on a number of different things, worked on some great learning material, and, uh, um, you know, Mohamed, as it said in the intro card, uh, an Epic um, grant recipient, but also a mega grant recipient, and I think, uh, you know, before we get into it, just introduce yourself and tell everyone on the stream a little bit more about yourself and you know your development background and some of the stuff that you do. You've got some great websites you've worked on. You're an author. You are a programmer. You're, you know, a game developer. You do all kinds of things. But you know, tell everyone a little bit more about yourself in general, and then I'll get into all the things that I like about you. Awesome. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm from Egypt. Uh, I started uh, programming in very early age. Uh, at that time, I was not a very good programmer, still. Uh, I, I was programming for, uh, for just, just applications, and one day I, I wanted to work uh, on, on a game. Uh, this is how I started my journey with uh, game programming. At that time, there weren't any engines or anything, so the way you do it is just C or C++ or Visual Basic. It was uh, doable at that time. This is 1990-something, uh, and from there, I started learning by myself until 
today, like uh, 15 or 20 years later, I still learning by myself. I work in quite a few companies, uh, mostly as a programmer, sometimes generalist programmer, uh, lots of the times uh, engine or tools programmer, sometimes technical direction. Uh, usually I don't care about what's the title as long as I'm going to do lots of fun stuff. My journey was Unreal started uh, quite some time ago, it was Unreal 2 and Unreal 3 for a company called uh, Spicy Horse. I, uh, at that time, I really, really liked Unreal Engine. It was a very big world for me. I started learning a lot of things and a lot of things about game creation and, and the game engines. I learned from the source of Unreal 2 and Unreal 3. And when Epic uh, put Unreal 4 uh, publicly for free or for like $11 or something, I was almost the first person to buy. I, I purchased day one. And within a week, I start putting videos of my findings, like you having the source code between your hands, you can learn anything, you can do anything. So I start digging in the source code and make uh, tutorials and videos and, and articles and tools and lots of fun stuff. And this is how I learned Python as well. Like one day I found uh, about Python API, it started to show up on the, on the GitHub uh, source code. And I was like, oh, what, Python in Unreal? So I started tracking this and I keep my eye on this and, uh, and compiled the version of the engine. And I just started with it. And we are here today to speak about Python with Unreal. Fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I think, um, gosh, how long has it been? Like four or five years ago? Uh, we started communicating. Uh, I remember you. You know, you've been an author. You, you. Uh, um, tell us a little bit about the the work that you've done as an author too. Yeah. So I. Uh, okay. It is funny because uh, I never thought about writing books or anything. But uh, like the first months of uh, Unreal Four, like Unreal Four Point Zero or something, I saw. There is a hidden plugin called Paper 2D, and the name caught my attention. Like, what what is Paper 2D? It was ex like hidden in a folder called Experimental. So I made a build for this and start looking at it and went, oh, I can make a 2D game with Unreal. And right away, I start recording some videos and put them on YouTube. If, if you find this is probably the first 2D with Unreal uh, video series, it was. Uh, April 2014 or something, same same months as uh, as release. And from this tutorial, I got the, the publisher uh, contacting me and say, hey, it looks like you digging too much into Unreal. Are you interested in writing <laughs> a book for this? I said, yeah, why not? It sounds fun. So I wrote a book uh, for uh, iOS uh, game development with Unreal. At that time, I was still a Mac user. Uh, so I have iPhone, I have... Uh, uh, whatever whatever devices and have the accounts, provision uh, files and have everything set up so I can uh, make the book happen. I spent some months and I learned it from uh, from the publisher. Uh, I learned a lot from them about writing, about uh, how to structure a book, how to really, really make educational material. I made a lot of mistakes and they were <laughs> patient and they forgive me for that. Uh, and because they forgive me, when when the time came uh, after the release of my first book, they contacted me. Are you looking into write a second book? So I said, Oh, uh, okay, yeah. I have two kids, so let's make two books. <laughs> so I wrote the second book, uh, which is uh, Unreal uh, Rendering Essentials. And uh, then after the release, it's been like one year off. And then they contacted me again. At that time, I had another kid. So they asked me, are you interested to write a third book? I said, yeah. So three books for three kids. And <laughs> I wrote the Mastering Unreal Engine with C++. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, what uh, What I think was important, you know, to me is that, uh, you know, back in 2015 and 16, uh, I was working in education with Unreal Engine and, um I, I was visiting many universities and, you know, helping universities develop curriculum for Unreal Engine. And, and back then, there were just not a lot of books uh, available for universities yeah. that wanted to uh, have books, you know, for students that were learning Unreal Engine. So um, I remember getting my hands and reading um, 
lighting and rendering essentials and mastering Unreal Engine. And these were some of the books that I really enjoyed and liked, you know, to recommend to people uh, because there was not a lot of material right after Unreal Engine 4 launched uh, to help people to understand how the Unreal Engine renderer worked. Um, uh, you know, physically based lighting and rendering was still something that in, in many ways was relatively new. Uh, we had, of course, our documentation, uh, which was, you know, has matured and gotten better and better and more robust over the years. But these were really helpful books. And it's one of the, the, the places where I became familiar with your work. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that I started reaching out to you initially was like, hey, you know, this is really helpful material. And I've been recommending these to instructors when they say, well, you know, where do I get material to present to my students? Especially since, you know, back in, you know, these days there's a wealth of material and online material, and it's easy to tell your students to go get online material. But even as early as or late as 2015, people were still really liked a lot of physical books, you know, to, to get their hands on. I think things have transitioned a little bit more over time where people prefer online learning resources and, uh, you know, justifiably they're easier to update than, you know, and they, you know, they kill less trees maybe. Uh, and, and, you know, but still a lot of people like that physical artifact. They like to sit down and leaf through a book. And I know I still like to have a physical book to look at. And, and these are still both fantastic books. There's still lots of great things to learn from these books. And I, I strongly recommend them uh, because they still are very relevant. And a lot of the, the foundations that you lay out in these books are really good. So for anyone in the stream who, who still likes a good, you know, artifact a good book to, to read I, I encourage these books because there's really good fundamentals of understanding the lighting and the rendering of the engine even though i don't back in 2015 that must have been what version of unreal engine 4 was that uh, for uh, lighting and rendering maybe like 4.7 or yeah, something 4 like this because I unreal think. like came out for uh, uh 2014 so it was almost uh, a year old i'm sure they've asked you to, to update them quite a, quite a few times <laughs> we came a long way we've come a long way that uh you know at this point is yeah. almost 20 versions of the engine since uh that original book uh you know but i think that's a testament right because since then you have built websites you have also built uh, some ag additional great youtube resources uh another thing that we communicated yep. about is that you built a I, I think it was like a 27 video series about building a tank game inside of Unreal Engine, which I really appreciate and really yeah. like because uh, what what you did is you built uh, the same game, both in Unity and Unreal Engine, uh, and you sort of showed the path yeah. to building both games in Blueprint and in C Sharp, which I thought was very, very intelligent and very clever because uh, for anyone at the, and this was probably two years ago, two and a half years ago, it's been, it's been a while since uh, you've done those. It's maybe? even longer. Has it been yeah. longer than that? It's even longer as a tank game, yeah. Right, because there's a lot of people who are like, well, I, I understand how to do things in C Sharp, but I don't know how to transition those skills into Blueprint. And so I thought that was a very clever series because you were very helpful in, in describing that process of understanding what you would do in C Sharp and what you don't necessarily have to transition immediately to C++, but instead can transition directly into Blueprint. And and I still think it's a very helpful series because there can be misconceptions specifically for programmers that they have to take everything they do in C sharp immediately into C plus plus. Can you just talk a little bit about that before we get into the Python uh, discussion? Yep. Yep. So one of the things that sold Unreal for me, Unreal 4, to, to make the switch from any other tools I'm using, like I, I used to have my own engine Believe it or not, it, it is not that great of an engine, but it can handle some 2G games. But when I found Blueprints, like I thought for a while, if I have a full-time job and I work for a company and all the day I'm writing C++, when I go back home, I don't need to keep writing C++. I need a break. I need to prototype something quickly. I need to test something. I need to try out new things. If I'm going to do this with C++, it's going to take a very long time. And this is what actually sold the blueprints for me. Yes, I'm a C++ programmer, but when, when I start uh, like putting the fundamental uh, workflow for myself, I said, okay, 
the big things I'm going to do in C++ and then expose it to blueprints. And in blueprints, I can use this to prototype quickly, super quickly. Uh, back then when I used to use C Sharp and things like Cocos or any other tools and like GitHub now have lots of free engines. When I used to use those things, C Sharp was, was really fun because it, it is much faster to write and it's much faster to see results than C++. But then Blueprint came out and then I found Blueprint itself is faster than the fast solution that I used to use mm. with C Sharp. Uh, so I started using Blueprint. And this is actually why I went into the road of Python was unreal because I do need to write tools for myself most of the time, like working while working. Like I think it's a habit for any programmer that if there is something that I need to do more than five times, then it's better to write a tool for this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Was, yeah. Like it, it's fun and faster to write tools, but at the same time, if I'm going to write every tool I need in C++, it might take some time. Sometimes uh, I need to, whatever I need to write, I need to, to add it to the engine itself. And we'll see in some examples today uh, for some things that really requires the engine source to be recompiled. But at the same time, I don't want to waste my time like recompiling, especially I have a very cute little BC here that uh, go crazy and make too much noise and <laughs> cannot be usable when you compile any C++. Right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, That's a good this point. was a selling point for me. <laughs> yeah, it's here, my cute PC. No, that, that's an interesting insight, so yeah, this, really, that you, compiling requires kind of a, yeah. a decent computer or your compile times get very, very long. And for folks who are, you know, you said you started running on a Mac. Um, and even now, you know, yep. uh, a lot of us are running on laptops or underpowered computers and stuff and, and not having yeah. to compile code is, is a big deal because yeah. it's already done. <laughs> so, yeah. The point. thing is, uh, yeah. Like the thing is like when you work with C++, mostly for companies, for example, you work at Epic. If even if you need to compile something, you're probably going to compile across the network. So you are going to use the power of other 500 mm. BC. So you might compile the engine in 10 minutes. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you need to compile alone at home, no network, just simple BC. So it's uh, it might take quite some time. So you need to find the solutions. You need to find ways. And I found Python. Like let's say 80% of the tools that I need for my productivity can be achievable with the Python API uh, exist with Unreal Engine. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, the reason I choose Blueprint and later I choose Python for tools. With that said, I still do lots of tools with C++ because Python first, it is not, uh, not everything exposed for Python. And second, what if you need to introduce something new to the engine? Because at the end of the day, what the Python API in Unreal does, it is communicating to the C++. Right. But what if you need to communicate to something that is not actually exists? You need to make a new asset type. You need to make something. And then, okay, you need to take your hands dirty and go to do it in C++ way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing uh, before we get you know deeper into Python is that um, you, you contribute, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, when we release a new version of the engine, the first paragraph of... Uh, all of our release notes typically uh, mention all the contributors to that release of the engine. So uh, you can see that uh, many people who are in that first paragraph are not uh, uh, always uh, members of the engineering team at Epic, and and we do a lot of polls from GitHub and uh, and people who are contributing to a particular release of the engine. So. Uh, Mohammed, you've been on a variety of different releases of the engine. You've contributed to the engine. Uh, how many times would you say? That's a lot. Since yeah. even before 410 or something. Uh, it started with uh, small things and it grew with, with the time. You know, like some people have hobbies like swimming. Some people have hobbies like cycling. But other people have hobbies like fixing bugs. So mm -hmm. it's fun to do. Yeah, so, you it's, know... It's a good way to learn a lot about the engine, actually. Right. So, if, you know, for any of you uh, who are watching the stream today who are programmers, know that uh, it is always an option for for 
non-engineers working on the engine to contribute to the engine and and to be able to do that and we probably should you know do a stream specifically on that because uh you know we have educators uh university professors who contribute to the engine as well uh but so let's dig into you know today's topic specifically you know python is still uh considered an experimental feature of the engine um you know and that means that it is still in early phases of development and it's not been uh, officially titled uh, a part of the engine, which means also that it is a plugin in essence that you have to enable in order to use the feature. Uh, now, to clarify that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, that it is not a native part of Unreal. You know, there are many features of Unreal that are plug-in based, which means that it's not part of the core executable, uh, executable uh, but that it is, you know, part of the engine. It's just a module of the engine that you have to enable. But it's still in experimental mode, but it's been in experimental mode since version 4.20. Uh, so, you know, it's maturing very well. And now that we are in preview 4.26, um, you know, it's been in experimental mode since, you know, for six versions of the engine. So it's maturing really nicely. And you've been working with it since 420. Is that correct? Roman? As soon as I found it, I believe it, it probably could be earlier than 420. It's, uh, it's two years for now. I think two years. Can't remember the exact number. Yeah, I think. But I released the, the, the freeze, so like, uh, so while, while learning, I, I start to build some tools. And then when I found I have like a group of tools that is not project specific, it is not specifically for my project. It can be used by anyone for anything. So I gathered them and put them in a, in a GitHub repository for free. Uh, this was like a year and a half ago. Right. Uh, so six months earlier I started. Right. Well, so, you know, what's kind of interesting is that, um, if you if you're going to GitHub and actually getting the source of the engine, there are things that that you can start working with even before they end up in our release notes, and people can sort of you know. So uh, if you're compiling your own version of the engine, you may encounter things that you know are there before they are officially announced in our release notes. So uh, I think one of the very first mentions of Python in an official capacity is in in the 420 maybe even 419, but I think the first time that there's official mention, uh, as far as I can see, is 420 uh, of the engine. But if you're actually working in the source code on a regular basis, you may be able to find that there were um, ways oh, to access. Candy. You can access Python before 420. And, and, you know, that is a, for those of you who are actually working with the source code, you know, Epic is very transparent, and you go to the Trello board, and you can find that there's lots of things that we're working on that actually are in, in the source code. But um, so it's still though considered experimental, uh, and uh, you have to enable it as a plugin, which I'm sure you'll cover a little bit later on. Um, uh, so you can run Python in many different ways, though, right? So you, when you enable Python, you can run it, of course, inside of the editor, but you can also run it as a command line, uh, and there are command line enablements so that you can run it uh, in many different ways, because Python um, is very much a pipeline tool, and it can be used very much as a pipeline tool. And I think that, that one of the, the reasons that it was uh, brought into Unreal is because there are many... Uh, industries like the film industry and of course the game industry that loves to use Python as a pipeline tool to help implement pipeline. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you really talk about in the course that you developed for Python um, is that you can use it once, it, like you said, to uh, not do a lot of repetitive tasks, uh, but also you can run Python as a startup a tool and you can enable it in the project settings as a startup tool and, and do a lot of things that really uh, help um, if you're building you know, custom studio versions of the engine where you want things to happen at startup or, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about sort of running Python uh, and other ways to do it that way? Yep. So should we start with uh, like a sharing screen? Sure. Yep. Okay. I share this screen. So, can you see it? 
Yes. Okay, so I uh, I'll be creating here an empty project. It's third person template just to test out our stuff. Everything as it is, and it's create a project. Uh, by the way, I'm using four twenty seven, which is uh, because I'm using the GitHub source. So if it crash or you see something that you don't you are not familiar to see, this is because uh, it's four twenty seven. Also, if you see something not familiar, because this version also have, like it's my personal version, so it have some modifications, and I'm using it to show some stuff I modified for the Python plugin or, uh, to, to use it for my own projects. So hold on just so, a second here, if I may interrupt. Yep. The rest of us plebeians out here are on like 426 preview three, and you're already living in 2023, <laughs> running 4.27. This is a, a GitHub. <laughs> this is this is the power GitHub. of GitHub, everybody. I and, just want to know what's the future like. You know, well, and this is what's cool is this is like bleeding edge internal at Epic. When we have changes, we push them up to these streams, and so you're working like picture either the same like day this. or a couple of days behind our engineering team. So if you really want to see what's next in Unreal, get on GitHub and and you know start dicking around like like you have. It's uh, it, it's pretty amazing. Like yeah, I, I didn't this even is, know this is uh, one of the things actually. Thanks for that announcement. As there is, <laughs> and this is actually one one of the things that I I found and investigating and studying right now. I found it uh, in two seven. So. Um, I'm looking at it right now. It is a new tool uh, I found in the source. But yeah, back here. So first thing to do if you need to use uh, the Python plugin is just to enable the plugin. If you go to the plugins and in the scripting, you need to enable the Python editor scripting plugin. As well, uh, yeah, it here it tells you that it is experimental or beta and then, yeah, it's at your own risk. And yet I didn't find any problems, maybe one percent of a problem, but I it is really really smooth and there is no issues. Uh, I say yes, and you need the editor scripting utilities because we need to do some work today with the editor as well. And for sequencer and movie render pipeline, it is things uh, if you are going to make tools that is touching those parts of the engine, like if you're going to make a tool that is automating stuff in the sequencer, so you need to enable this. So. Uh, you enable this part of uh, of the API just in case, and this requires a restart. It is very quick thing, so let's do it. I have my project here. It's very important because we need to see something in the project file here. As soon as it show up, if you go to project settings, where you have all the things for your projects, there's a section for the plugins, a new section show up, which is Python. Don't panic if your version doesn't have those. Those are things I have added for my own uh, engine version. But what we need to do here is we need to enable something called the developer mode. Why we need to enable the developer mode? If you look here into the intermediate, uh, in, like next to your project, there is an intermediate folder. There is nothing called Python here. If we enable the developer mode, it requires a restart. And as soon as we restart, there is a new folder will show up here, which is very important for you if you are going to uh, write Python and you need to write it in an efficient way. Give it a time. And then you have something called Python stop. And in this folder, there is a new file called unreal.py. What is this? For people who are not familiar with Python, just a second, I need to open it here. Okay. Uh, this is a very large file, as you can see. Even my, my mouse can't scroll. You see how large it is? This is what I call a definitions file. This file contains all the definitions for all the things that are exposed from the C++ source to Python API. Uh, if you look to older versions of Unreal, I, I will be uploading a video later today on my uh, my channel, showing there is a like I, I'm comparing an old uh, Unreal stub file or definitions file from the very very the very first uh, versions of Unreal and with uh, this one. This file is already 13 megabytes, which is a huge uh, for a text mm. file, 
uh, and in, er, in the very early stages of Unreal Python API, it was like 100 kilobyte, and the file was way smaller than this. It's a quarter and of a million lines. If this tells you something, <laughs> yep, yep. If this tells something, it tells that there is a lot of work in progress happening in this API, and every day there is a lot of stuff being exposed uh, to make it usable. So. To make a use of this definition file, you need to add it to your uh, IDE. Uh, this is very important for the, the auto completion. When you write code, just to not write while just just blind, you don't know what you are you you writing. It's uh, this file makes it easier for you to write the code. Uh, this file usually I'm going to use uh, UI charm. So. If I look here, this file goes to the installation of PyCharm system, and then you put it wherever the version. I have several versions of PyCharm. I put it in all of them, and this makes the definitions or makes my IDE can recognize those uh, Unreal definitions. Uh, the other thing, important thing about this uh, developer options that we enabled uh, here in the Python project settings. This will allow you to get more uh, console messages in Unreal Editor that tells you when you make a mistake or you make something wrong, it's going to show you what actually is the problem. It is like when you do an issue with C Sharp or C++ and then the compiler or uh, Visual Studio tells you what is the issue. This is the same thing, but it's in Unreal. So it, it shows you here in the output log what issues uh, you have. And this is very uh, helpful. So I'm going to open uh, my py charm here, and I will make a new directory for this stream, just quickly. Make a directory. Call it stream, and here let's start adding Python files. I will add uh, a Python file, and let's call this one logger. The very first thing you do, and the most important thing in any programming language, is just logging stuff to the console. Uh, this is uh, step number one. Write something for Unreal. You need to import Unreal, which is going to import. Uh, you see here, when I when I write, uh, my IDE can now recognize there is something called Unreal that I can import. Mm -hmm. And in this Unreal, I can say Unreal. Log. When I say log, it tells me you want a log or log error or log warning or whatever. So I say just log and old school. Old no school. Running this can be done in many ways. One of the first ways I can do, I can get the, I can browse to this file. Show in Explorer. I can get the file name or basically the file name and file directory and come here to my Unreal and here in in the output you have different options for the output command or python if I'm in command I say I want to execute python and this python going to be this file so it runs a python I see this green line which means it runs this file and then my file has this log python it say hello world so uh, the same thing if if I go back here and say okay, it's a real log. For example, warning, warning, and maybe real log error. You see the difference. It's wrong. This is how fast it is. I, I just threw the thing here. I can come here. I can execute it. Oh, don't forget py the file. And then I have all of them. This is a difference. Colors are important when you log stuff. So if I'm going to do this, this is a very simple tool. If I'm going to do this with C, it's going to take at least five to 10 minutes to make the header file, to make the source file, to make the plugin file, and to compile everything and to go back to, to the editor and to use. Uh, this basic tool. Uh, this is one way to run it. Uh, the other way to run it, I you see here, if I put the, the Python file the, uh, directory, 
a pass and then I press enter, it is not going to recognize this because it, every time I'm in command, I need to write py first. But the, the output log have different modes. You can switch to the Python mode and here right away you can put the file name and then it's going to run uh, just in case. Another way to run this is uh, from file, you can say execute Python script and then you locate your Python and then you execute it. This is, this is a couple of ways of executing uh, Python. And one thing to mention, uh, Unreal is using, I guess, 2.7, Python 2.7. And Unreal have its own Python, which means you don't have to go to python.org and install Python. Uh, so for example, I have here different environments on my PC. This version of Unreal is this one. So if I open here, this is my, my Unreal version. And I search here in, in this engine folder for python.exe, I get this one if I run it. So this is the interpreter for Python of Unreal. But at the same time, I have my own Python here. Python, I have two different versions of Python installed. This is 3.7, I'm going to run it. This is its interpreter and 3.8. Why I'm showing this? Okay, I have a package. Like recently, I installed a package called NumPy. I, I, I installed a penalty of packages. But when you install a package, the package will be installed for your default environment, which means if you're Unreal script, you going to use a package with Unreal, you need to make sure you install the package with the Unreal uh, version of your Python. So if I'm going to 3.7, where I installed my, this is my 3.7. It's where I installed uh, uh, my package. If I, for example, say uh, import numpy as mp, then I, I get no errors because now my Python 3.7 did import this. But if I try with 3.8, where I'm sure I didn't uh, install this, give me error it say there is no module called numpy and because i installed it in my version however my unreal uh despite my unreal is is, is on my pc and uh, it, like what i want to say is that unreal is using its own version so i installed here but it's not going to go to unreal anyway so if, if i done with unreal like import numpy as mp also it complains that it's not exist so what I mean, be careful that Unreal have its own version of Python. If you need to add any modules or import or like extend this, you need to do it here in your engine uh, version of Python. Don't do it with your default uh, Python environment. That's okay. very helpful. This is, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is how we, we can uh, log something. Other thing we can do, like uh, as Luis mentioned, ways of running scripts. There is something if you noticed in the project settings called startup scripts. And a startup scripts is an array on a list of scripts that you need to run. Uh, you need the editor to run as soon as the editor started and before it start ticking. So, for example, if I I have here my project, I'm going to close the project. Uh, and I'm going to open it again. You'll see as soon as the project open, there is nothing uh, unusual happen. Just open and I see here all the, the usual loading messages. But if I go to here the project settings and within the Python settings, I add to the startup scripts my script. The, this is script. Then as soon as the editor, uh, it will ask to restart. As soon as the editor open, it will search for this file and then will execute this file. And then we get the three messages here. So it's after the editor did launch and before it start 
ticking. Uh, okay, so now we do this, but it doesn't look good and it is not usable. What if we share the project with someone else? He doesn't have necessarily to have this long pass. What we can do here, we can just put the name of the script and this is another way of executing scripts with Python, but we do something called additional passes. And additional passes is whenever you try to run a script, Unreal can't recognize this, but it knows that this is a Python file. It will go to the additional passes and then it will start searching for this file. If it finds it, it will execute it. If it doesn't find it, it will throw an error for you. So if I put here an additional passes and then I browse, I can now browse to this stream folder that we just created and restart. This additional passes, anyone can change their own additional passes, it, it, it is fine, but the core element, which is the script itself, it doesn't change. So here, it ran it. So there is many ways to run Python scripts, and those are the most common ones. So okay. to be to be clear, <clears throat> Python scripts run both outside the editor, inside the editor, and but not really so much during gameplay like blueprints and C mostly do. They're, they the so <clears throat> just to be clear that really the intent of Python is not to replace blueprints or C for building game code. But it's really for all that yep. stuff that you do outside of the game code, uh, working with the editor and working with your assets and working with your different applications where Python is really cool because it, it works in all of those applications, presumably. <laughs> yep. Yep. It is meant to be an editor thing only. And we will see in some examples later on that we can do things at the game while it is running in editor. But if we try to do the same thing while the game is running uh, standalone, not everything going to happen as long as we including uh, or we importing uh, uh, an editor module. Uh, so we can go with another example for assets, for example, to show, as you mentioned, it works with assets. So let's see how this uh, can work with assets. I'm going to start typing here. Let's make a new script, a new Python, and let's call this, yeah, it's Python file, of course. Port set. Okay, first thing first, import Unreal. Okay, we need to deal with something called global global editor utility base. If we are going to work with the editor, we need to work with the utilities class. We need to deal with something here with the content browser. So if we look here into the documentation, which is very great reference. This is a Python API documentation, by the way. It looks strange, but it is really helpful as long as you search for what you want. So I, I know that I need the global editor utility base, so I search for it. And then it showed me this is the global editor utility base. It have lots of functions that can handle lots of sensitive stuff in the editor. What I need, I need to select an asset and then, uh, or a bunch of assets, and then just check some information about those assets. Because later on, this is a core, uh, this is a core of manipulating assets. You can get them, and then you can. Uh, uh, query about their information and based on this information, you can do it. If this is an asset is not used, okay, let's delete it. If this is an asset that should be duplicated, it should be moved to another folder. Let's automatically do this. So in, in here, we are going to search for, for example, get, oops, get selection or get selected. So you find right away, it tells you there is a get selected assets and this is going to return you an array or a list of objects. So what we need to write is basically Unreal, the global editor utility base dot get selected assets. It is the same way you write in any programming language. So I'm gonna come here, and before I I I, uh, I use the global editor utility base, I will store it somewhere. So I say Unreal class class sorry. 
us and I'm going to call it editor details and this is basically the unreal dot global editor utility base now what I can do I can say a new variable called for example selected assets and this selected assets is basically editor utils it, okay can't show yeah it was loading you get selected assets so now what i know is that this is an array of a selected assets and in order to make sure that this is correct i'm going to loop through this array i'm going to say for asset in selected assets and for every asset for example let's use the unreal log the thing that we already made unreal.log but not hello world we're going to say the asset and if you look here like keep the, the api you reference for everything here it say it, it's going to return you an array of objects so what is object if you open this object you see it is something inherited from object pays. What is object pays? Oh, okay, this is the pays object that every single Unreal is inherited from, which means anything you're going to deal with in Unreal have those functions. So you can get the name, you can get uh, the full name, uh, you can get uh, the outer, like the package, you can get the pass, you can get a lot of things. So I'm going to say this asset dot get, it should show up, the auto completion. Okay, we can show name and say real dot log asset dot f name example real dot log set as name only that we can get one more funny one it's very useful and i count on it a lot uh, the class get class which tells you what class is this because sometimes you can create a very modular script python script and this can run on all the assets and paste on the assets if it's animation assets and do that if it's a blueprint then do that if it's a texture then delete it or do whatever so you can say unreal.log said us. And because it's a loop, we're going to just get tired of writing under the clock to add like a break or something in all of them. Now remember, we already added uh, an ad uh, the additional passes like uh, into the Python script, and we can right away just type the name of this script, and it will run uh, right away. So I'm going to just quickly show an explorer. Is a name come here? A. Okay, let's select something. Maybe mannequin animation. Select all of those. Or maybe three, four. And then we can right away here write py or script and run it. And boom, it says syntax error. And this is why Unreal. Uh, output log with developer mode is very important. It tells me here there's an issue with line number four. It tells you exactly where the issue is. And if the issue is with, uh, with a component that cannot be casted to another component or something cannot be casted, it's going to give you all the details. So you, you're trying to cast this and it cannot be casted to that, uh, which is very useful. So we'll come here, line number four, and we forgot this, which is a Python thing. Again, py, this is script, run it. This is what I'm talking about. It tells you selected assets in this line. Line number seven, object needs an argument. Global editor utility bits. Okay, let's come here. Line seven. Okay, selected assets. Yep. This. Now it ran, 
it get all those those you see like there's four four uh, four parts every asset it tells you its animation blueprint this is a pass uh, its name is third person anime bb and all the information we ask it for querying the information is a key to start manipulating and working with with the assets and and do lots of changes on those assets is that clear any questions looking good not so far yeah that's, cool. that's awesome let's go ahead to another fundamental part of the editor scripting which is creating assets so now we can query assets and based on this we can start later like modify them rename them uh assign a texture to a specific material or something like this uh or replace assets but let's see how we can create assets because this is touching another important part uh, people who work with the C++ source are familiar with, which is called the factories. Uh, so it's important to work with, uh, with factories who know how this uh, is working. So I'm going to create a new script. I'm going to call this one uh, create asset. And of course, we're going to import Unreal. And we're going to create a new asset. So this asset will need a name. So we'll call it for example, I'm going to create a blueprint, so call it blueprint name and equal meaning something like this. And then this asset need to be located somewhere. This blueprint, I need to put it somewhere. So you can say blueprint as, and this will be where I'm going to put this asset. I'm going to usually people putting stuff into blueprints folder inside the content, but we don't have one. We don't have to worry about this because if we said this blueprint is located into the content folder inside the subfolder called blueprint, Unreal is going to create this folder for us. And in Python API, this content folder, it's not actually called content, it's called game. If you, you see it as a content, but if you hover your mouse, you see like the tooltip say it's game. So it's important to know this content is game so i'm going to say i'm going to put my my new asset into inside this game and inside blueprints something like this now i define it the name and the path for the assets that i'm going to create how i'm going to create this asset assets are created with something called factories factory is like a factory in real life the milk factory make milk uh, cheese factory make cheese same thing, if you're going to make a blueprint, so we need a blueprint factory. So just right away, we come here to the Python API and we search for blueprint factory. And then we get a lot of blueprint factories. There's a blueprint factory, there's an animation blueprint factory. Everything you can create in Unreal have its own uh, unique factory. So if I open this blueprint factory, it has a function called create new and this is what we are going to, to, to use so we need to use unreal.blueprint factory so i'm going to store this into a variable i'm going to say my factory or factory equal to unreal.blueprint print factory so now i have the factories that i can use to create assets okay when you create a new blueprint, usually you right click, you say blueprint class. So you now say, I need the blueprint factory to create a blueprint for me. And then it asks you pick a parent class. So we need to simulate this step of picking a parent class. And this is in blueprints called setting the parent or set parent or set parent class. If I create one of those here, for example, this actor, and I open it. First thing you see here, it's called new blueprint, but its parent class is actor. So we need to modify this, or we need to decide this before we create it. So we come here, we say factory. Dot. Factory is an object, is an Unreal object. As I mentioned, everything is inherited from Unreal object. So if I press here on the factory, it's inherited from object. And object is inherited from object base, and object base have something called set editor properties or set editor property. So we need to set the editor property that is called parent class. So if I get this factory and say set 
editor property. The property name that we need to set is parent class. And we need it to create what type? Any type. Example, actor, character, player controller, anything. So let's create a player controller. I go here and say I need to create or the parent to be unreal dot player controller. Now I I I choose my factory. I prepared the factory and told it what actually I need to do, but I didn't make anything else. So I'm going to say asset tools. This is a new variable equal to Unreal. But set tools helpers. And this is important one to be used when you create stuff. If I go here to the API and search for the asset tools helpers, I get the asset tools helpers. And there is something, okay, I, I get here the asset tools helpers. This is asset tools. And here we need to find create. So create have something called create asset. And with create asset, we define a name, which we already choose here. We put a name here variable. And then we define a package path. Again, we, define, we created a variable to hold our path. And then the class, the factory, the class we're going to create a blueprint, the factory, we already created our factory and prepared it and told the factory we need this specific parent. And yeah, we leave this as none. Yeah, so this is the thing I like about this API. It's very simple and it, it shows to you exactly what you expect. You can sometimes copy the entire line, paste it in your code and just modify those uh, parameters. And it tells you if there is a return, what is the return type. It's very easy to read if you are not uh, familiar with Python or even if you are new to programming. It is not like uh, the C++ one. For, new beginner, for the beginners and new people who come to the C++ and want to write tools, they find it overwhelming and huge and complicated. It is not complicated if you are familiar with the language itself. Uh, but it is big. It's a big engine, so things are huge. <laughs> Anyway, so we need to use this create asset. So we got here the asset tool helpers. I just need it to get asset tools, just get the reference to the asset tools. And then I say my factory, let's finally initialize this factory. Factory. Uh, as a factory. My file, or my asset, or something like this. This equal to the new function that we just saw asset tools, so create asset, and create asset needs the name, which is blueprint name, and needs here, this is uh, the use of the stop file that we show how to, to generate first. It shows you a tool tip what, about the parameters that you need to put. It tells me that I already added this asset name. I need to add the package pass name. Uh, so blueprint pass, it tells me I need the uh, asset class. Skip this one. And tells me I need the factory. We already have the factory. And just a second. Now we create a file. And I think it's good to go. Let's just try to see if there is any issues. What is the name of this file? So it's create asset. So we come here. We can run the script right away. Or we can from file, which is my favorite way, execute create asset. And then suddenly we had a new folder called blueprints. And if you open it, it has uh, the streaming blueprint, which is paste. If you hover the mouse, it says a parent class. If you can see it like the third line, parent class is player controller. If you would change this and you change your mind, and this is a C++ tool, you're going to take quite some time to change this. So I'm going to show you how fast it is to change this. We don't need player controller. We need the uh, game mode. Boom. It's game mode right away. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to change its name as well. Something like this too. You just change it right away. I can then run the same script. It created the game mode. Right away, I, I don't have to compile, I don't have to waste time, I don't have to do anything. Okay, what if 
I give this tool to the artist or to whoever designer, whoever the person is going to use it and say, okay, can, can this file, instead of having the start, can it automatically save? I don't have to waste time to do this. I can come here, can basically, oops, wrong one. I can come here to the API and I can search for save loaded, for example. It is still in the editor asset libraries that we use. It's called save loaded asset and we pass an asset to it and we give, we say, uh, only if it's dirty or no, it's true by default. So we can come here and say, Unreal. Editor asset library dot save asset. What asset we need to save? It's my file, the file that we just created. And I'm not, I'm not going to put true because it's true by default. So now if I delete these two files, I run it. It creates a file and it's automatically saving. Oh, okay. It has an issue. It's in line 13. Okay, blueprint as a string. Okay. Where it is? Here. My file. Okay, it should be fine. Editor asset library, save asset. Okay. I think it was not save asset. We have to save loaded asset. There is another save asset somewhere. No, not assets. Asset. Because you can pass, there is a two versions of this function, save loaded asset and save loaded assets. Here you can pass uh, a one object and here you can pass an array of elements. So if we run it again, it creates the asset and save it right away. Select the parent, do everything quickly. Imagine you need to create lots of assets, lots of types, lots of things. It, it depends. We'll see later uh, when we create a streaming world, how we can create a streaming world uh, very quickly. Amazing. All good? Yeah, amazing. Awesome. Okay. But we don't need always to create the same asset like, we, we come here to change the name, which is kind of boring. What if we need to make it easier? We need the user to define what name, what number of assets. Here, here's the, the file create one asset. Every time we need to create another asset, we have to run the file. What if we can give the user the ability to define the name of the new assets as well as uh, the number of those new assets, or maybe the what classes or what, what, whatever. We can make a use of the, something called arguments or command line arguments. For people who are not familiar with this, basically when you launch a script in Python or even when you launch an EXE or any application, you can pass parameters or arguments to this. And this can be used uh, inside. For example, you can launch Unreal Editor, which is this editor, and pass it a command argument called game so and, and a project. And then it is not going to open you this editor that you see, but it will launch the game itself. So we'll see how to do this in Python. I'm going to copy the entire code here because we're going to create assets. So instead of writing all from scratch, we can paste on this. So I'm going to call it the uh, oops caps. Create asset with args. And we're gonna paste everything. It's still import Unreal. Still, we have the same name. Still, we have uh, we put them into the same folder. Uh, but we need new stuff here. We're gonna keep the factory. We are going to use the factory actually, and we're gonna define what is the number of assets we will be creating, and what is the name. So we're gonna say created assets count is equal to because we need the the arguments that is going to be passed to this Python script, we need to import something called sys, which is system, basically. Uh, this equal to the first value, the count is going to be a number, so it's system.argument number one. 
arguments is starting from zero. It's like any array indexing. It starts zero, one, two, three. But always in, in I think in all software uh, uh, engineering languages, the, the item number zero is going to be what is running. So if I'm doing this with Unreal, uh, the argument number zero is going to be the path for Unreal EXE. If I'm doing this with Python script, the argument number zero will be the Python script path. And then we're going to do another one, which is the name. We need to pass a name. So name, and this will be actually string, and this will be the argument number two. But this means every time we run this, all the assets will be created, will have the same name. And this can lead to conflict, for example. Because uh, remember, now we are not using the right click menu. If you are using the right click menu, I can say a material, leave it. When I right click and say another material, I'm really smart enough to pick a different name for it because it knows that there is one already with this name. But when you use Python, this is not actually the case. You need to define names uh, uh, carefully. Uh, in order to avoid issues. So I'm going to say here, create uh, asset name plus equal, where is the percent? G. G is uh, like a number, so which means that we are going, we are going to replace this value with a number later on. Now we have the factory, it's the same factory. We have the parent class, same. Let's say we're not going to make game modes uh, right now. Let's say we're going to create characters. We have a game full of characters, full of enemies, full of stuff. And then the asset tools, it's still the same, but instead of creating the file, we are going to make for loop. So for X in range, what is range? What, what is the number of assets we want to create? It is actually the created asset count. So not semicolon and then we create the file and then we save it uh, instead of giving this name which is which is uh, uh, that one uh, we are going to use uh, that thing that we have created here so we're gonna use this and we say percent, and what is what we need to replace this D with is the X. X is basically a number. Everything remains the same. So now if I ran this script, it give error if I don't pass to it a number of assets I need to create, and if I don't pass to it a, a name of assets that I need to create. So I'm going to copy the name of this guy create assets with arguments and with this way if we have arguments we cannot run from here because if i run it from here it expects some values and it won't find those values and it will complain to me okay but i can run it from here i can say python this i need to create 10 assets and all of them called uh ap mbc like mbcs Right away, I have NPCs, 10 NPCs, all of them have the names that, that I choose, and all of them have uh, like indexes. It's even more fun. We can take this to a whole new level. We wow. can make it easier than typing here. We delete everything here. We come to the content browser. We create a editor utility widget. Let's call it uh, NBC. Oh, not NPC even, like assets editor. Now we open this assets creator. We come here. Second, we add a button. And there is a text on this button. And maybe, oops, yep. We, for example, say it. And then we add here a name. We need uh, to define a name for those. So we're gonna search for text, text box, and give it a default value. For example, my 
set and we need a count like a number so we can add a slider for example for this this slider will be ticking one tick we can have up to 1000 assets who knows um, and minimum value is one asset and just we're going to add a text to display what we are doing in here so i'm going to add a text here and i'm going to bind this text to the value of this slider so create binding and then we're going to get the slider we're going to get the value we're going to hook it here or maybe we need to truncate first because it's a float so we need to truncate this value so it show up as a string uh, as a as an integer and now when we press create this is the cool part we need to just simulate the process of writing something in here so we're gonna say uh, execute console command and this command will be as follow i'm gonna append this will be py as we used to do it followed by space followed by the script name followed by the arguments space the first argument is here the first argument number one is the number so it's basically this slider value we're gonna get value and we're gonna truncate this to make sure it's an integer and to string and then it's followed by space and followed by the other argument which is the name it's gonna get this text box I'm going to get value. Oops, get text. And put it here. If everything is all right, we should now be able to right click here, say run editor utility. He opens this folder. I say I, I, I'm going to call my assets uh, characters, zombies, whatever. And then I'm gonna create 194 one of them. And Unreal will do it. It's very easy to hook a Python script with the UI, with the UMG, and then you have everything created, sorted, renamed, and just ready that to use. Super of cool. course, if you are going to make those, like all those zombies uh, variations <laughs> uh, based on. Uh, on an MBC class, then you don't you are not going to define the class here as a character, and then you are going to define whatever class you are going to use uh, for this. But it's very easy to connect things with UMG to make it more uh, modular. Uh, we can even add a new attribute here to define what class we're going to create. So we can even uh, define the class from here, and we can have as many arguments as we want, like the maximum number of arguments I needed in a script was 10 arguments and Python never told me it's uh, over limit or something. So we can do a lot of stuff with, with this workflow. That is super cool. That really cool. is. Awesome. It's, it's like, uh, it's one of those things where each piece is kind of like, uh-huh. Uh huh. And then you put it all together and you go, oh, mm. oh, there's all the things I can do with that. Oh, because, <laughs> uh, you know, up until yep. that point, you're like, oh, I don't want to have to type in the Python thing. And how am I going to teach my students to do that? Um, and one of the questions that came up here was like, you know, what's a, a practical use for this? And, you know, obviously in pipeline, there's a lot of practical uses, but I wanted to address as an educator, as a teacher, um, learning this sort of stuff can help you in deploying your lesson plans when you're teaching interactive stuff. You can, uh, you know, create tools and workflows so that your students don't have to master all the complexities of whatever it is, whether it's, you know, submitting to source control or even just naming objects the right way or whatever, you know, I've seen teachers who, uh, have scripts to to set up the folder structure for every project so that when the student starts they just yep. run the python it they say what's your project name and it builds the folder structure so that every project 
looks the same so that, you know, if you're grading 200 yeah. projects, it's nice that everything's in the right place. Um, and then even yeah. then you can use script if everything's in the same place to like pull out certain assets or, you know, just validate that they created whatever it was. So, um, you know, outside of the, that like production workflow in the classroom, tools like this are, are really, really yeah. helpful. And, uh, it's very I'm helpful. always impressed with how teachers kind of take these and make these really cool workflows. And even I've seen yeah, entire really, like grading really good systems. Examples for this. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. A really good example for this when I create like as 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 a person who uh, create projects to share with people so they can learn from those projects. Sometimes, not sometimes, lots of the times when I create a project, it starts as a prototype. So you don't care about a texture name. You don't care about an object name. You don't care. Sometimes you don't care where you put assets. You have textures next to materials, next to meshes. But later on, you need to deliver to those people something easy to understand. And this is why there is some, some assets here, like there is uh, some scripts here I made and put in GitHub. There's one called Organize Assets Per Type. It put all types of assets in one place or prefix all assets, for example. It search for all, for example, animation, blueprint or animation files and gives them a prefix anim. Or if it's a blueprint, give it a prefix pb. Or, a, or if it's a particle system or Niagara, it call it the fx. This makes it very organized, and then you can distribute all your content, as you mentioned already. All the projects or the educational projects are distributed, have the same, uh, I call it, have the same blood. Mm -hmm. Like, they feel the same. Like, when a student look between different projects, they don't feel, oh, this is organized in a different way, or a naming convention here is a different than a naming conversion there. But having such a script, creating such a script, you can organize all your projects quickly, like, just like this. Yeah, let's take one step back and share everyone your GitHub because uh, I don't know that we formally shared yep. with everyone that you have a GitHub with already a bunch of assets. I know it was put in the chat, but uh, yeah, this is a really valuable uh, resource. There is a forum post uh, here as well for it. Uh, maybe the pass is very long for this, but uh, yeah, it's in the Python. It's in uh, it's in the editor scripting section of the forums. It's called Free Python Scripts Library. And uh, when I was uh, doing those uh, scripts, I used to make small videos like those ones, like showing how to use each of those, like very small, like uh, the thirty second, one minute, that's a video showing every script in action, how to use it and how to run it, and and what is the expected result of this uh, scripts. So it is uh, good to, it's good thing to check. So you share assets in here that people can use immediately, like the one you just showed, which is great, and they're good examples of uh, everything yeah. you've been describing already. Give you one more great example. Yes. Okay. Before we Unreal do, makes before we do really wallets. quickly, there's a, yeah, a quick sure. question uh, that's come through the chat. Uh, people are asking if you can run Python scripts at runtime. Uh, they're they're asking during game mode, but I imagine that's uh, the same question as at runtime. Can you um, can you run Python scripts at runtime? You can see we can satisfy people. Okay, let's create one script here, one of my favorite uh, things. I'm gonna create a Python file. I'm gonna call this uh, game called Python uh, because I have different uh, different versions of game called Python or different reasons for a game to call Python, but this one is a screen shutter because it takes screenshots. I'm gonna import Unreal as always. And then we're gonna use something called automation library. It's, uh, bum, bum, bum. Here. Automation library. So this automation library, it does automation for stuff. And at the same time, it allows to do things while the game is running in editor. Uh, and it's very useful, I find it's very useful because it helped me to take screenshots where issues happen in my game. Mm -hmm. So you can trigger this. If a problem in a game, it takes screenshot from you, for you, either from the player view or from a specific point. We'll see now. Uh, there is penalty of functions here, but the one I use is the high res screenshot, which is an equivalent to this amazing one that I really love. And by the way, a couple of options here. I use the one who added them. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> 
the power of source code. So after importing Unreal, we're gonna like store the class. Uh, I'm gonna say, I, I like to do this. It is not necessary, but I like to do it because I like to keep code organized somehow. Uh, because this is also the way I, I did learn uh, Python. So it's Unreal U class. Class, I'm gonna call it automation lib or automation library. It's basically Unreal automation library. Now what we're gonna do is say automation automation lib dot take I with a screenshot which have lots of arguments. It's gonna ask me about okay the size on X twenty eighty the size on Y seven twenty you can go up to whatever and like. Uh, I, the last thing I tried was 4K and it was fine, but it takes uh, quite some time. It's basically the same feature, uh, same feature, uh, the same window in the editor that I show you. Uh, we're gonna call the picture uh, my fancy picture at one time, for example. What else? Uh, camera actor for now it's none. We're gonna see this later. Uh, none is a keyword for. Uh, for Python, which means, which like null for C++ or something like this. Uh, mask, we don't need mask. Uh, HDR, we don't need HDR. Compression, it's by default set to low. It's set to... Ah. It's easier to copy it from here. Compression, latency low and i have no notes and this is a script to take a screenshot from the editor ui it doesn't look very fancy right now but we'll see why it is fancy when we do it at runtime but i'm going to come here to this uh screenshotter and just py screenshotter okay there's an issue with the script it's in line seven you see what line seven is? Automation library take screenshot. Take high res screenshot 2080. Okay, flash. Why? Okay, another error. Still on line seven. Let's see what the issue is. Where it is, where it is. Yep. Automation library. Okay. Let me piece a picture. Need a name. Need a, a type. NG. Still, same thing. False, false, completion. Okay. It doesn't recognize what is compression tolerance is. And here it's a error named compression tolerance is not defined. It thinks that compression tolerance is a variable and I didn't define it. But actually my mistake is I didn't write unreal with compression tolerance. So I say this, this compression tolerance is something subjective to unreal. So py this, enter. And then we have the screenshot here, this image. This is not super fun yet. What we can do here, we close this, grab that. We can, because every time now I'm going to capture this, it will give me the same picture, but different view. Like for example, if I'm looking here at this guy, I'm gonna run it from here faster. A screenshotter. So I'm gonna get this picture. From this view, if I go here next to this question mark, I'm going to run the same script again from here, this one. It's going to replace the picture, which I don't need. So what we can do is we can come here and we modify this, uh, the value here and replace it with something like uh, the time or the date time or anything. Okay, so we're going to do here from date time port date time we import the time so we can get the current time value or the current uh, 
value of date and time because if you got the, the date, it is make no sense because it's going to replace the picture again. So we're gonna say date time now of x or something is equal to date time dot now. And then we're gonna convert this to a string so we can uh, use it string from time and need it percent uh, percent day percent months percent uh, year or probably it can't recognize because the um here and then percent uh what's the hour now percent what is the, uh, the minutes and what is the second and let's just put all into quotes ah man i hate this visual studios is smarter in doing this now we have the date time as as a as a suffix or as a value so we can say this is the name of the image plus the date time or maybe underscore plus the date time plus dot png now when i take this uh, screenshot here i have this image and when i move my camera like here I have another image next to it and so on and so forth. So I have multiple images. Now, can we use this at runtime? Yeah, of course, why not? So what we can do is I would go to this guy, this player, and let's say every time he jump and he jump, consider it every time the character die or every time the character is stuck for 10 minutes, uh, cannot move for 10 minutes. Let's take a screenshot. So. It's very simple, as simple as uh, execute console command with this script name, not this one, where it is, it's here, screenshotter. Simple as this. So every time I jump, I should take a 720p picture, screenshot. So I move. Oops. Stuck. Why? Because you're giving a live demo. <laughs> yep. It has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Task manager. Responding. Oh, why? I have two windows. Luckily, okay. Unreal never crashes. It just stops responding. Or it goes away, yeah. but it's not a it, crash. Totally not. Maybe because this is uh, my seven, uh, my four twenty-seven version. Oh yes, I forgot we are using the the version that we say don't use. Future version. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're messing with the space-time continuum. Something's going to go wrong here. Quantum <laughs> physics. Uh, PP. Two brands, said person. So when I jump, secret console command, this console command, that's fine. So here, okay. I jump, take screenshot, I jump, take screenshot, I jump, take screenshot. You can, I, I connect it with jump and you can do this the same thing from C++. Uh, you can do the same thing from uh, Blueprint, anything. It's not only taking a screenshot, but you, because this is Python, you can include, uh, you can include uh, a library, a library like, uh, I don't know, there is many libraries like uh, Skippy, NumPy, PIL, like uh, Python imaging uh, library. Mm -hmm to start uh, do some changes in these images, like uh, resizing the image or clipping the image or cutting pieces of the image or adding post-processing to the image or adding notes to the image, adding some text to the image, any lots of things you can do uh, with the Python libraries. And if I come here, I have all the pictures and this is Python pin called from, uh, from within uh, the editor uh, while running. 
Another example I have uh, in here, actually, let me grab it from the other screen. Okay, so here I have this project. It's going to execute uh, a script that is searching for actors with a specific tag and then animate them. So for example, you see this flying actor. It has a unique tag. Oops, not components here. It has a tag called Python can manipulate. And at runtime, when I press play, uh, thermal blueprints are resolved. Okay. Let's come here. Let's just disable those things. Okay. Let's just delete everything here for now. I'm still complaining. Okay. You know what? I'm going to delete this. Blueprint. Don't need it. <laughs> yeah. No time to fix it. Try and bug me now. So if I press play, <laughs> why now? So this box is not moved by Blueprints, is not moved by, uh, by C++ or anything. It is moved by uh, Python. I just search for specific, for static mesh actors that have a mobility, that are movable, and then I start set their, uh, set the, get their location and change the value by using another function called set uh, location. I can find it here. And maybe not here. Like here. So this actor basically is going to search for uh, this. Uh, this Python script is basically going to to get uh, all the gameplay actors. Uh, it's going to get all actors of a specific class. I set my class uh, to static mesh actor, and then it's going to validate if any of them have the Python can manipulate. So, which means if I copy this one, uh, for example, here, copy this one and set it to movable so I can animate at runtime. And then in the tags, copy this tag value and put here, give this, like here, if I press play, this guy will not move. If I give it the tag, uh, actor tag, and then press play, both will be moving. And this is animated from Python not from blueprints. So this is an example of, of like making a benefit of a Python script, but at runtime. So could you package that into a packaged game? How does that work? It won't work uh, in a packaged game because it uses some editor utilities. Gotcha. Uh, the thing is at runtime, the editor utilities uh, most likely going to be stripped, so you can't use them. However, sense. the funny thing that I found in the source code of the plugin, uh, the Python plugin is runtime plugin, which means you can, with some modification, use it at runtime. So out of the box right now, you, s you still need the editor yeah. because it's got the whole plugin. But yeah. there's some hints. Exactly. If if you want to get brave, yeah, you can play the game, but <laughs> in the viewport. I gotcha. Um, exactly in the viewport. Uh, yeah, but you like if you want to like move actors and do those things, it's going to be naive to try to do this with Python when you have blueprints. Uh, it's 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 going to be much faster than mm -hmm. even learning it. Uh, but you can use the Python API to do things like taking screenshots from specific locations. Like, mm -hmm. like I showed here, we, we were taking the screenshots from, uh, from, a, from, from the player location, but we can put a camera in the wallet. Like for example, I can quickly modify my script with another version that I have here. Uh, I this script with this version and I'm gonna delete those and now Every time I jump, the, the image will be taken from a viewport of a camera. So if I come here and uh, I create a camera, like camera actor, and let's say this is my overview camera that 
show the entire level. And I come here to the camera and give it uh, a tag because my script, uh, I, I like to, to, to use tags for, uh, for Python scripts. So I calling it shooting cam, for example. So now every time I jump, for now it's jump, but in, in, in a game you're testing in editor, you can hook this to any uh, undesired behavior. But now every time I jump, there is a screenshot should be saved. And looks like it didn't work. Yep, it didn't work. Uh, okay, we can check this later, but yeah, it was working, to be honest. <laughs> Screenshotter. Okay. No clue why it doesn't work this time. Yeah, yeah like uh, for example, if I come here to the level blueprint, open level blueprint, and I paste, let's say, the same node at startup, for example, uh, where's the level blueprint? Ah, disappear after the conversation. So you can play. Execute this command, maybe delay like, uh, two seconds or something, and then execute this command, this Python command. So I'm here. Well, it looks like there's an error in here. Yeah, it say editor in play mode, but uh, yeah, usually it should work. It it was working earlier, maybe not in 427, but this was an experiment <laughs> I, I was doing into bending the runtime thing and uh, execute Python from uh, viewport. So there's a lot. I can, I can imagine that there's some work going on right now by the development team uh, on yeah, the Python side things. of things. So I can imagine that that as you you know working in 427, there's a good chance that that some stuff is. Yeah not working as expected yeah. currently yeah and this is good pretty for happy it's worked as well uh, as it has <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i think this is good for educators by the way to be one step ahead because if you need to teach something you need to teach something unique and something not exist like if you want to teach uh, if you want to teach how to anything like make uh, an android build you'll find the hundred uh, tutorial about this, but the pissed video was the first one because those, this was for the person who didn't find any tutorials and he was digging really, really deep until he found mm -hmm. how to do it and share it with others. So peeing in the master and, and uh, trying to get the latest uh, version from the master, build it, it gives you the opportunity to find the new tools, the new experimental and hidden mm -hmm. games and know about them and start uh, learning them as early as possible. Uh, this is a really good uh, tip. Yeah, I imagine uh, a lot of the folks that are experimenting with virtual production, uh, being able to build small tools like this that can help them do virtual scouting and uh, create playback windows or, 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 you know, I know that I've seen and gone to shops where they have camera bookmark little UI windows where they're like, you know, we want to set up a shot here and set up a shot there and they have notations and they have yeah. uh, all kinds of things that you can write to the screen. And, and so having the ability to do that in Python really quickly uh, and build these little in-engine tools that, uh, that you can do in Python, especially people coming, for instance, from the film industry that have Python knowledge, maybe from working in, yeah. you know, Maya or something like that and very quickly get in here. What I'm seeing you do is that you use uh, the the blueprint command tool, and the way that you use the command tool is very effective. And so, is that is that a, a currently like a best practice that you use all the time? That you hook it up to an issue a command that calls the Python script. Yep, I do this a lot because uh, like tools that you cannot see and you cannot communicate with are not usually very efficient. A tool that you cannot communicate with is a tool that is going to do specific exact task. But if you need a modular tool that you can modify, then you need a tool that you can see and you can uh, define your metrics, define what you need to change, what you need to do. 
and I found this is uh, can be done with with UI. At the beginning, I was doing it via Slate and C++, but found it uh, like uh, Ouch. it's killing the point of using Python. <laughs> right? Using, uh, yeah, you are using Python for speed. So why going to C++? And then I found that oh wait, I can use the editor utility widget for my benefit. At this time, when I was using the C++ thing, the editor utility widget was not out yet. Uh, but as soon as I found it and I saw I saw it in one stream or something, uh, Epic were showing how to use editor utility widget. I take for me that this can be more useful than what is it was built for. And then I start hooking it with what I know about Python and, and, and the mix came together and became uh, very useful. You can actually, in the course, uh, I show how to create a launcher, which is basically a lot of buttons in one window and each button is going to, to show, to execute a specific Python and this specific Python is going to do uh, whatever it's going to do. So you can have lots of editor extensions and it's hooked into one window. You can call it my window. And then you create a Python to launch this window. And then uh, you put this Python into your Python mm. startup scripts. Mm -hmm. So you have a unique tools that you created for yourself, let's say 10, 20 tools, and you have them always launching when uh, Unreal Editor uh, launched. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention here is the plugin itself is very fun to work with in a C++ level as well. As you see here, I added uh, some functionalities to allow me to execute Python scripts uh, post-importing, after importing an asset to uh, execute one, two, three, four, or whatever. And after loading an asset, do one, two, three, four. Or after saving an asset, do one, two, three, four. And then you can create an asset that rename stuff, and you can hook it here. For example, uh, post saving, it's going to add prefix. Then you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about renaming files anymore. You <laughs> just import the files. If it's a blueprint, when you save it, it's automatically going to rename itself uh, BB underscore whatever name is. Uh, so yeah, it is. It is. Uh, you can expand the plugin more. And once those are so, stable, so you, added, like you added you added these to the plugin. Sorry, you added these yep. to the plugin. Ah, so, yeah. so if someone were to get this right now, they wouldn't they wouldn't see these. Uh, no, it's not in twenty seven. Uh, yeah, it's not in twenty seven. So or twenty six. This is, this or is my twenty seven version. <laughs> this is how how it looks when you open the Python. Uh, yeah. So the Python plugins editor settings, and here I just double clicked uh, uh, another project that is built with twenty four or twenty five. Just a second, it will show up here. <laughs> My PC is tiny. Literally, my CPU is just this size. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it is powerful <laughs> somehow. So, uh, while this is opening is. for those folks on the stream that maybe are interested in learning Python uh, and don't know Python currently, do you have any recommendations for uh, resources just for learning Python that they can then apply to? Um, working in Unreal Engine, because maybe some people don't even know Python. They, maybe they've been working in Blueprint. Maybe they've been working on other things. There's tons of resources this I know. This API on, reference is very, yeah. is very helpful. Like I would say majority of what I learned was from the API reference. Is that right? And the other part was from what I know in Unreal itself. Like if you are familiar with Blueprint or familiar with C++, you will find things here. Like. Because you know that when you have an actor, you can set actor location. If you have, uh, if you have an actor, actors have tags. You can get tag. So if you search for those things, you'll find them right away. Or even if you just search for actor and Unreal Actor, then you can start comparing all the things that you have here with mm. what you already know in the blue brands. If you are an already Unreal user, it will be a matter of week to be able to write your own scripts without uh, looking on the internet or anything. All what you need is just uh, this uh, API reference. It's very helpful. If you need uh, a hand, someone to take your hand, then you can search in YouTube. YouTube now, uh, I I start seeing lots of people start talking about Python and start using, uh, uh, start using Python in their uh, API. I saw one artist uh, Epic shared about before. He's an artist, he's not a programmer at all. He starts using the editor utility widget to create fascinating tools to use in his game. Uh, so YouTube have lots of stuff uh, for this. Uh, also the forums. Uh, there is a Python or editor scripting section in the forums. 
purchase here yeah this editor scripting section mm. uh, people ask a lot of questions about python in this section and uh, i i sometimes i answer and sometimes i i go and look for like the good the good thing about programming there is no right way to write code regardless it's a python or anything else so it's always healthy and always good to look at what people write so you can uh learn and evolve your knowledge. So this section was mostly about uh, editor utility widget and those things or, and utilities. But now mm -hmm. you start seeing lots of people speaking and asking uh, about mm -hmm. uh, Python. Uh, this is the project, as I mentioned to you. This is for uh, 424 or 425. And if you see in the Python here, you can only have mm. uh, add additional passes and start up scripts. But all the other ones here that is uh, post import, post loading, and post save, it's things that I made because I, I needed them. I'm looking forward to your pull request on the GitHub so we all get that. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully soon. <laughs> there is, uh, like I prefer to fix it, bugs. Yeah. Yeah, uh, new features, features are tough because, yeah, I know. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> there's a lot to think about and make sure it works and yeah. stuff to add and, and And sometimes uh, there is one ongoing, actually. So, like, uh, yeah. Well, that, you know, like, it really, at first, you know, we looked at this, but after seeing your examples of how, what Python can do and how you can use it and how you can kind of decide to use it in the editor, out of the editor. It's, you know, it's kind of its own thing that the editor ties into. So seeing how you can, yep. you know, automate all of that and then, you know, tie that into these events that happen in Unreal in your day-to-day -day workflow. I hope people can start to see yep. how that can unlock, like, like you said, uh, you know, with your extension there, what a cool idea when you import an asset or you save an asset for it to check if it's named correctly. And then if it's not, just fix yep. it. Wouldn't that be neat? <laughs> Do you have just a general? Even more fun. Show you something, uh, something a lot interesting. One last thing. Sure. Uh, if you open here this this level, this is actually a big world. If you open levels, you will <laughs> see this this world made of. As you see, those sub levels. Uh, Hundred and thirty-seven sub levels sub -levels, are created yeah. with Python. Oh and man! Applied here, all of them. Wow. So you created all the levels and connected them to your wallet and give them identical names like wallet division or my map or whatever and just with with a very tiny script. Uh, I've I've had to do something wallet. similar like that for a gridded world, um, and there were 128 grids that I had to go and manually make a name <laughs> and place. You should keep those lines. In place. It was like. <laughs> This was, you know, pre-editor utility, pre if only yeah. there were blueprint or, you know, I didn't even think about level creation. Lots yeah, of I've tools now can help. Yeah. Where it's like, this, oh, this it's, it's only three work. button clicks to do it, but I have to do those three button clicks 128 yeah, the same, like, times. Like and the there's earlier, five, like six more seconds than five times. between each click. Yeah, more than that. That's a really <laughs> good, like, rule of, yeah. rule of, you know, good rule to follow is once you're, once you hit that number five, or you see there's more than five, um, there's and there's a good I'm gonna chance invest that if my it's time five, tool. Yeah. right over the length of a project, it's going to be more than that. It's yeah. do you <laughs> get have it, a get yeah. a script out now? Do you have a general best practice of what you might do in Python over Blueprint? Uh, since you you know you work in both uh, fluidly, what would you do in Python? Uh, and say, well, I, I'll do this in Python instead of Blue. If it's a content browser, definitely. Anything in content browser, it's just 99% I'm going to do it with Python. Okay. Neither Blueprint nor C++. The only way I, I deal with C++ while doing something for the content browser, if I introduce a new asset. Mm -hmm. If I'm creating new asset types, then I, I do it uh, in, uh, in C++. And while compiling anything needed in the content browser for this new asset, I just do it with, within the C++ uh, plugin. Uh, but if it is something already exists in Unreal and it is already existing in the Unreal uh, module, then I just do it anything for content browser. As you see, like those wallet, this wallet is basically maps in the, in the content browser. That makes good sense.
Yeah, there is also in the viewport, if I'm going to spawn stuff or instantiate things or move things or rename, sometimes you keep dragging stuff and putting in the world and then uh, you end up with a lot of things that is not organized. Then I need to create folders uh, using Python and then pair a specific, uh, what's called metrics. Like I say, okay, if it is a light post-processing or skylight or, or whatever, then put them in a folder called light. If it is a mesh, put them and the mesh uh, mobility is static, put them in a folder called static mesh and, and so on and so forth. So it is, it's very easy to organize uh, this outliner, uh, this world outliner with Python. That's really helpful. Are there any questions in the uh, the chat in particular as we're uh, approaching uh, the magic hour of four o'clock here in uh, Eastern time zone and uh, Epic Games headquarter time, which is typically the time we start to wrap up the stream. We want to make sure we address any of your questions. This has been a, a really informative stream and we hope that you guys really uh, take a lot from it. And thank very much, uh, Mohammed, for sharing all this great insight. Uh, I know that I've learned a lot from today's stream. Yeah, I think I think Python uh, and and this whole tool side is is not something that a lot of people uh, know until they're in the industry and they've worked on projects and they see that there's this whole tools and pipeline group and you know, it's it's <laughs> once if you if you're working at you know Epic or EA or whatever you're probably not hitting the add import button in Unreal um, <laughs> you're probably running a Python script or something in Shotgun or something you know completely bespoke um, and so it's really important for students to be exposed to that so that it's not you know a total system shock the more that they can see uh, how that works in the real world that's that's really really helpful. Um, and it's it's important for students to see that like that these careers exist and that they're in really high demand because it's a weird skill set that most that people don't they don't know. So they don't go to school going, I want to be a technical pipeline director because no one knows what the heck that is until they've worked with the technical pipeline director. And they're like, oh, I want to do that. I like doing that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, or they've worked on a project and they've naturally filled that in. So really key for us to do stuff like this to show educators and students that these roles exist and that they're really cool and, and that these skills can help you, you know, make your own projects, but really stand out in the field. Because if you're an artist, you're cool. But if you're an artist who can make stuff that makes all your other artists on the team better, then you're a pretty awesome artist assets. So these are the sorts of skills that we like to show uh, to our education community that's outside of what you kind of typically think of in the programmer, character art, environment art sort of bubble. Very much in visual effects, pipeline TDs, um, Python is kind of bread and butter for them now. So the fact that it's within Unreal, they can take the same principles, the same concepts, mm -hmm. and actually apply them across the entire pipeline, which makes a massive difference. The kind of renaming stuff and the kind of importing creation stuff, um, you know, it, it's phenomenal. You know, particularly if you have something, I know so many people struggle with naming conventions for rigs, for example. And um, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> just if you could <laughs> name it exactly the same with an underscore L. Okay. Uh, exactly, and eventually you're going to miss one of those 400 bones for sure. <laughs> well, even for those folks that, uh, you know, they're, maybe they're working on, you know, a huge suite of characters now with open world games, you know, you have to. Mm -hmm. have, and so the, the fact that you can go into a folder, select every asset, do a turntable and export that into a folder or something like that is uh, just a huge thing that you can either put somebody in an intern role or whatever and have them do it for a week, or you can push a button, have it done in, in a few seconds. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that is exactly what uh, people that integrate with the shotgun or something like mm -hmm. that will yep. create a, a, Py a Python tool or, you know, maybe even have to go and purchase some of these tools or download or whatever or expect it from internal libraries. Uh, but the fact that you can make it and customize it yourself is a huge benefit. So uh, hopefully this has been informative to you all. Um, anything else that you'd like to add, Mohammed, before we start to wrap up today's stream? 
Thank you. Uh, if anybody have question, can reach me on the forums, uh, on Twitter, or the blog, or anything. And yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm pasting up your course again. Yes, we do have a special treat uh, oh, here yes. at the end of the stream. Uh, you know, as we'd mentioned, uh, Mohammed has a, a course on Python that uh, he created and is on Udemy. So uh, he was very generous to share a special code that we are sharing at the very end of the stream because we're going to share it with you guys who are participating. And then, uh, but by the time we make it up onto YouTube, it probably will disappear. So I'm going to post it up. Are we ready, Mohammed? The time? Here we go. So yeah, it's the time. It's, streaming on the bottom here so if you use the special coupon code uh, python uh, ue4 for python underscore stream uh, you'll get 50 percent off of uh, the course that uh, he has and uh, mark has also posted it there and so by the time this makes it onto the youtube this will probably disappear we'll just edit it right out uh, so um, once again thank you very much i'll let it scroll a couple times as we are uh, Rolling the and that coupon out. code won't disappear if you like write it down now and you need to buy I it tomorrow it lasts, it'll be okay I, I think it lasts for five days or a week it's it's like an option i found in the website i click 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 and copy uh -huh. it. they ask me right. to write the name so, so you, write you've got a couple it. days to take advantage of it but yeah, then yeah yeah back to full price so mark put it in the chat it's a udemy class uh it's a pretty massive class right uh I don't, how many videos are in your class there on the Udemy class? Mohammed, how many, how many different uh, units are there? I don't actually, four check. Hours. I just go to I'm answer the it. questions. Yep. Four <laughs> hours near on the hundred video. or something. Yeah, it's four, four hours and uh, it's near a hundred uh, student. And uh, yeah, the, the quality of the video was, was high because I, uh, I, we recorded multiple times. I guess Luis knows this. <laughs> uh, I recorded multiple times. Yeah. Great. So be sure well, you take advantage of uh, of you know uh, this course if if you've enjoyed this material. We we don't typically do this, but um, I think that you know just being able to take advantage of this kind of a tool set, I think is really valuable. So uh, we hope you enjoyed today's stream. Awesome. And I'm going to stop ticking this so that we can capture the end of the stream. And uh, thank you all for coming. Next week, next Friday, we have another great stream. Uh, you know that we've been doing a series on becoming uh, you know, a character artist, uh, becoming a AAA technical artist, becoming uh, a variety of different things. So next Friday, we're doing another one of those, becoming a AAA audio designer. So we've got uh, Zach Bellick, uh, and Dean, and uh, a couple of the guys that are some of our senior audio designers, um, musical directors at Epic Games working on Fortnite, and, and uh, uh, they're going to come in and talk about becoming um, what it means to work in Unreal Engine as an audio designer. So it uh, mm -hmm. should be another great stream. Uh, I know that audio sometimes... Uh, is is not talked about, you know, and we talk about some of the programming features, but actually implementing those features in a game of the scale and scope of Fortnite. We're not particularly going to talk about Fortnite, but we're going to talk about working in audio as audio designers uh, inside of a real-time tool like Unreal Engine. So it would be another amazing stream. Please join us next Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And we're really excited to have you all back. So without further ado, Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark. And Thank we'll you. see you next Friday. Stream. See you all is next Friday. Out. Thank you all.